Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce you, my dear friend and a great researcher, today, this evening, to you. Our speaker is Hakan Tureci. He's from Prince University of USA, and uh, he's going to give us a very interesting uh, subject, very modern subject that we are all anxious to hear about. It's about machine learning with quantum dynamical systems. Before his talk, I would like to take this opportunity to thank him personally and also on behalf of our COVID community, because this talk is a unique talk in the history of COVID meetings. For the first time, we want to access broader audience, especially to younger audience, to give a taste of modern quantum optics, quantum information, modern quantum research. And thanks to Akan, we have the perfect person to, to give you this uh, talk to you. So thank to him for this great support and great support uh, to our, uh, hopefully will be a tradition, uh, a series of talks on evening lectures. <clears throat> Hakan is an associate professor currently in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Princeton University. So before Princeton, he received his uh, undergraduate and master's degree uh, in Bill Kent University and uh, received his PhD from Yale University in 2003. He performed his postdoctoral studies at Yale and ETH Zurich and uh, also joined ETH Zurich as an assistant professor in physics. After that, he moved to Princeton in 2010 and uh, he contributed in many branches of quantum physics involving nonocurum dynamics, statistical mechanics, classical and quantum many body collective systems. And his current focus is on superconducting circuits as well as linear and nonlinear optical systems. So thank you very much, Hakan, for being with us, and we look forward to this evening. Welcome. Thank you, Osgur. And good evening, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm delighted to be part of this conference and uh, have been enjoying the talks in my waking hours here. I believe uh, this conference is a great service to the physics and the burgeoning quantum information science community in Turkey. Um, so I'm, I'm, I wholeheartedly support it. Um, the added personal benefit is that I'm seeing a number of good old friends in the list of participants. Now, so uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to share some of our work with you. Uh, so today, uh, I want to tell you about our work on a hardware-based machine learning approach. Uh, we'll be touching on the foundational principles of implementing computation uh, on, through the natural time evolution of a given physical system to process information. For instance, to classify images or generally uh, to classify time-dependent signals carrying information. So today's talk concerns physics of computation, computation with physical system, sprinkled with some ideas from quantum measurement theory. Though I'm going to be focusing on superconducting systems, the story is relevant to efforts in optical and AMO platforms as well, so do not be turned off by that. Uh, this, this, this talk is uh, first and foremost geared towards the younger audience, the students, and to those young at heart, um, there's going to be a healthy amount of repetition. And I hope the experts will also find a few things that are interesting to them. So I encourage the students, please uh, jump in and ask questions. Um, that's important to me, um, if possible. So uh, this work, uh, so first people behind this work, the, this work that I, I'm going to be touching on today um, is primarily carried out with my students, Jerry Angelados, Kang Jun Hu, and Said Khan. I'll also be touching only a bit on earlier work um, on the so-called T1 versus M bar problem in superconducting qubit readout that uh, inspired uh, this present work. Um, and um, you know, for, for those interested in that part, I, I'm not gonna be talking so much about it. Uh, or the results are in these two references. Uh, so that work has been done with my students, uh, Moin Malik Aklak and uh, Alexandru Petrescu. Um, all right, let's see. Right, so here's the team um, and here's Feng Jin, Jerry and Said. Uh, we can't go back to our offices yet, but we continue to carry out our work and have fun doing it. Uh, together virtually. 
Um, so I'm sure there are few in the audience here who is not intrigued by spectacular news coming out of quantum computing in recent years. It is clear things are getting a lot more interesting than say only 10 years ago. But more than what these machines are capable of in terms of real world computing applications, these computing machines themselves are for some of us quite miraculous. This machine here housing uh, 50 qubit quantum computing chip uh, from IBM, um, you know, that is really a, a marvel of engineering like none other today. Very similar to what mechanical machines created by Leonardo da Vinci was in his time. They bring together major advances in microwave engineering, signal processing, refrigeration, uh, digital computing, and generally physics, electrical engineering, and computer science that humanity has mastered in the past hundred years. So living at a time to see these machines up, up close and working with them is truly a privilege and awe-inspiring. It took some while for superconducting quantum circuits that is a subject um, of the workers of today's talk to transition from a platform for exclusively studying fundamental physics to a powerful technology for processing quantum information. Nonetheless, these complex systems continue even more than before to present a wonderful playground to study fundamental physics problems. Yeah. So um, just touching on a few things here that we, we are interested in in the group, in these, uh, the, the, for, you know, well, there are uh, a number of very interesting problems uh, in fundamental physics uh, that we are interested in. Um, as you know, quantum electrodynamics has been uh, originally uh, invented for fundamental particles uh, like electrons in, in vacuum. And uh, today, uh, the quantum electrodynamics of solid state systems like this, metallic dielectric structures, artificial atoms made of Josephson junctions, the quantum electrodynamics of those they still contain a number of very interesting open problems uh, that keeps us busy. Um, on the other hand, you know, these things are now, you know, part of industrial efforts. Um, and uh, we have um, some interest in, for instance, uh, computational electrodynamic modeling uh, of these systems. How do you get from, you know, just uh, how this system is laid out in, in, a, uh, in a metal uh, to a quantum master equation that describes individual qubits here. Yeah? And so from that perspective, these essentially microwave photonic systems are really uh, complex systems with which you can study nonlinear optics um, in the extreme. Um, and lastly, uh, these systems are of course uh, of interest from uh, computing perspective, and we have recently got uh, gotten interested in computing with dynamical systems, which is what I'm going to uh, going to be focusing on. I'm showing um, here on the left an early example from Google that features nine qubits. Um, nowadays, you have devices that contain fifty plus qubits. Uh, but this early example is nice because you can clearly discern the basic architecture. Um, today, these devices are accessible through the cloud interface. And you can write a piece of code, just shown here, um, you know, piece of Python code uh, to carry out a certain algorithm you desire. For instance, a student connecting uh, from Trabzon uh, can just connect uh, through the internet and uh, essentially carry out a particular experiment um, on these uh, you know, interesting devices. Um, a computation uh, is essentially, um, in, you know, I'm showing here in this case, a, what's called a quantum approximate optimization algorithm, is essentially a known sequence of gates uh, that has generally uh, sort of laid out in circuit representation here. Um, and the repetition of this sequence of gates 
um, on an identically prepared set of qubits thousands of times. Yeah, so you you know you run this circuit with identically prepared qubits. In this case, three qubits, thousands of times. The end result, the information that is used to implement a certain function or an algorithm, is based on the info, um, based on the probability of occurrence of each bit string of ups and downs or zero and ones. Um, um, and one, uh, and uh, as you see here, for this three qubit device, you get, for instance, after a particular experimental run, this probability distribution of occurrence of these uh, quantum qubit states. Now, uh, of course, then this suggests that quantum computing is really different from classical computing as we know it, because it's intrinsically probabilistic computing, at least in view of the uh, near-term algorithms that we are uh, currently implementing. Okay, but what I want to emphasize for this talk is that computing is really all evolution of a multi-qubit system um, under the action of microwave and radio frequency drives and subsequently the extraction of the system state through a procedure called readout shown in this red block here. Readout is the most critical part of any computation you want to do with uh, quantum hardware. It is important to, for initialization, uh, important for feedback control, and feedback control is needed for uh, a future error-corrected uh, quantum computer. Yeah. So you want to carry out uh, uh, a readout procedure efficiently, accurately, and with as low latency as possible. So if you look under the hood though, what appears to be a digital computation, you know, in terms of spin ups and spin downs of individual qubits is actually something more subtle. It takes a finite amount of time to measure a qubit to be up or down after executing a sequence of gates. And this is, it, I'm showing here like a bare bones description of what's inside. There's a lot more, but this is all we need for now. Uh, this readout is uh, achieved by scattering a microwave pulse generated at room temperature. Through the quantum system, one wants to measure and passing the scattered signal through a chain, uh, including a quantum limited amplifier um, and mixers and so on. This typically uh, determination of a state subsequently, looking at the homodyne detector here, uh, takes uh, typically of the order of uh, microseconds, typically. Yeah. Then the signals are pro processed in, in a digital computer at room temperature that implements some kind of filter to decide whether the given signal is from a spin that is up or down. Now here, uh, it is important that much of the attention uh, in the design of, 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 of uh, the architecture of this device, uh, of this kind of a electronics and measurement chain is, is that, um, that the, uh, the devices in the measurement chain behave as much as possible uh, as linear dynamical systems. Yeah. And that is important because you don't want to mix the signal and the noise in a way that you cannot dis uh, separate later on. Um, so while the uh, processing uh, in the digital computer at room temperature, acts effectively um, for the uh, you know for what we are going to talk about in this uh, in this um, in this lecture uh, as a nonlinear classifier. Yeah. Um, in this talk, we will turn this upside down and replace the amplifier with another device uh, that I will call the quantum reservoir computer. Um, that does the nonlinear processing inside and allow ourselves to only use a trainable linear filter outside yeah, at room temperature. And the motivation for doing so is related to an important problem um, uh, that, that is known as the T1 versus M bar problem. Okay. So here's an overview of today's talk. Uh, the story that I will be sharing today has two parts. 
Um, and I want to start by giving you a brief overview of the particular problem I'll be looking at. Um, so you have a chart at hand to navigate when we get down to the weeds. Uh, the first part of the talk is on the physics of qubit readout. The speed at which one can accurately read out the state depends on the number of photons in the probe pulse. Yeah. And this, in turn, um, determines the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and uh, as you see, you know, you, the two different blue and the red noise signals that, uh, that essentially give us a signal for this, uh, the qubit uh, that is being measured is in the down or up state, right? You would like the signal to noise ratio to be as large as possible uh, so that you can make this classification as early as possible, right? And a simple model, the linear discursive model on which the idea of quantum non-demolution measurement is based, would say, well, you can increase the signal to noise ratio by sending a pulse with a larger power. But, and you know, you would expect something like this based on this model. But what happens as predicted by a slightly more accurate model is that the qubit now has a, a lot more complicated dynamics. And in particular, recent experiments uh, have shown that, the, for instance, the qubit relaxation time, T1, uh, ends up depending strongly on the power uh, of the pulse in the pulse. Um, and uh, and there's a, um, depending on, again, uh, the type of qubit, um, the T1, so I'm referring to sort of uh, the number of uh, photons in the system by M bar induced by the, uh, the pulse. Um, T1 um, or the decay rate of this qubit, generally, the decay rate generally goes up um, with M bar, okay? And that's bad. Um, and um, because this sort of puts you on, into a corner, you want to increase the signal to noise ratio, you want to uh, send a larger pulse to read out faster, but then that readout pulse has a back action on, on the system you're trying to measure. And uh, gen you know, generally at high powers, things are a lot more complicated. Um, this is something we have studied in earlier work, the physics of what happens and found that uh, really you need to start with a sufficiently accurate uh, first principles model of the system and uh, you know, what a very, good uh, approach is to build effective uh, quantum master equation models that is appropriate to the power level at which you're doing the experiment. This is a very general finding uh, that is, turns out to be important. But here, um, in the second part of the talk, I will ask something different. I will ask, can one come up with a signal processing approach that is independent of the power level, you know, independent of how complicated the dynamics, the system that is measured is undergoing um, and independent of the model you describe it. Um, uh, can one still uh, do a good job reading uh, out the state of the measured system? And one intriguing answer to that is an approach that is inspired by uh, reservoir computing uh, framework. Yeah? Um, and very briefly, what we want to build is a superconducting preprocessor that does most of the job before the electronics at room temperature processes the signals. The idea of reservoir computing in this context is to feed in the row signal coming from the quantum signal, something like that, uh, that we want to measure, right? And um, and inject it into a complex dynamical system to be specified later, which then evolves under the scattered microwave signals and maps the state of the quantum system that we are trying to measure into high dimensional phase space uh, of the reservoir computer. We will then ask, can then a trainable linear filter uh, classify uh, uh, the state of the quantum system? Yeah. So this uh, is, is a very different approach to computing. In this case, um, this is a computing is, is a signal processing task. Uh, respect to 
uh, von Neumann model uh, computing, uh, in terms of hardware at least. Uh, in fact, this hardware-based approach, uh, as I will bri briefly mention later, is a very general way of uh, thinking about computation. Okay, now let's get down to details. Um, Qubit readout is fairly standard today and is practiced almost identically uh, in all quantum computing efforts. It relies on the difference in the dispersive, dispersive shift of the microwave pulse is, um, that is scattered through or that is transmitted through a cavity that contains the qubit you're trying to measure. Yeah. Um, and when this qubit is far detuned from the cavity resonance, what happens is that the qubit in the ground state and excited state act as slightly different resonance systems. As a result, the uh, microwave propulse um, is, um, is uh, getting a diff slightly different um, uh, uh, amplitude and phase shift depending on the, um, on the state of the qubit. Uh, so one way to think about this is, you know, the qubit is like a tiny uh, dielectric uh, material that you have inserted in your resonant cavity. And that dielectric cavity has a dielectric index that depends on the state of the qubit being either zero state and one state, so that they to correspond to, uh, they give rise to different um, resonances. And if you know you arrange that you pass the frequency right in between here, if, if you drive the system with a frequency that is right in between here, the state of the qubit zero one is imprinted on the phase of the uh, of the uh, electric the micro field that is um, that is scattered. Okay, so uh, I'm showing here uh, how this looks like when the readout is optimized to death. Yeah, so this is data, uh, uh, recent data from Waldorf Group from 2017-18, uh, um, not that recent now, um, um, that uh, shows, for instance, the observed microwave signal uh, for a propulse um, in red here when the qubit is in the ground state, in, um, um, in the ground state in blue here. Okay, it's noisy, but not that noisy. And in the red um, up uh, for the qubit up state. Um, okay, and, uh, but, you know, such optimization, and you can easily distinguish these six signals now uh, already at very early times, 50 to 100 nanoseconds right here, right? But in an online quantum chip, which needs to be periodically calibrated to offset slow drifts and qubit parameters and whatnot, this kind of optimized readout is often diff difficult to attain. Yeah. In practice, the raw signal looks more like this. Um, the match filter. Uh, so what you have here is you know, individual records here for qubit prepared in the ground state deterministically you, that you can do with great precision. Um, and in the excited state in blue shown here. Um, and um, you construct, to optimize this procedure, you must construct a matched filter um, from a large set of measurements. So you repeat this experiment thousands of times for each qubit state, get um, thousand different noise signals. And if you average them, this gives you this red signal that you know, the evolution that's shown in this red uh, line, solid line here. Um, and for the, uh, for the qubits uh, in the excited state, the blue line, yeah. And uh, what it is, it essentially it is, is the match filter is uh, this U, which is this noise and microwave signals pass through a, uh, a, uh, a kernel um, that is constructed by averaging over many, many uh, thousands of, of samples. And then you get a new signal, Y of T, which I'm showing here for, again, for red and blue, uh, that, you know, where you can draw a decision boundary in this case here, so that when it falls on the upper side of this decision boundary, it's classified as qubit in the ground state. If it falls below, it's classified as the qubit up state.
Now, uh, this classification, uh, you can easily see that it can be done faster if, if these two noise signals, for instance, are dis can be distinguished faster. Um, and uh, that, uh, according to a, um, a, the linear dispersive model, can be done by injecting a larger photon pul pulse into the system, larger M bar, in terms of this parameter. And you see now the signal to noise ratio is pretty large. And the point at which we can distinguish the two states you know, is, is much earlier. Uh, this is different scales, by the way, um, up in, the, you know, in, in, in these two plots. OK. Um, but as discussed, what is actually happening does very much depend on the details of the experiment, the type of qubit, the frequencies, and so on. And generally, at least for transmog type qubits, uh, the standard, standard quantum computing variety, T1 uh, turns out the you know, intrinsic T1 time, relaxation time of the qubit, is, is uh, effective T1 time of the qubit, is found to uh, you know, get shorter and shorter as you uh, um, increase uh, the power in the pulse uh, for different M bars. Um, so, you know, that's sort of a, uh, you know, you can appreciate this is a big problem. And uh, there's been a lot of work to understand the physics of readout at high powers. Um, and in, in, in recent work that I will not be get, able to get into, um, we, uh, we found that really uh, the, uh, the, the right way and or the effective way to think about the qubit dynamics in this case is really to come up with a parameterized effective quantum master equation uh, that depends on the power level, on the excitation level in the system. Um, uh, but generally, you know, this T1 uh, sort of versus M bar problem is just one manifestation of what's happening. Generally, the system dynamics turns out to be a lot more complicated at, um, you know, when you drive those systems strongly. And here you, you can see, you, you know, you can understand in, in, uh, in this calculation with a more precise model, which is still not as precise as it should be, uh, you can see already get a glimpse of what is causing this, um, this T1 shortening. Essentially, you see here two trajectories. The blue trajectory is supposed to be for uh, the qubit in the excited state jumps early on to the lower state on average. This is the average signal uh, for the two noisy samples it's shown here. So they are no more distinguishable. You know, you have essentially the qubit that started out in the uh, excited state uh, is now misclassified as ground state. Yeah. This is uh, what is referred to as the readout error in the field. Well, you could say, uh, even if at high powers, the qubit dynamics is complex and difficult to predict or calculate, and other mechanisms may come into play as well, such as crosstalk and so on, can one build a universal hardware-based approach that is model independent, is robust, and hardware efficient? That was our goal um, when we set out um, for, to do, start the work that um, I'm going to be discussing in the second part of my talk. We, we believe now, um, after some, the initial preliminary work, that a hardware-based reser reservoir computing approach presents such a potential. And I want to tell you about um, some results on that. So uh, let me start with reservoir computing. It's a term that I've been mentioning freely until now um, without really defining it. Uh, reservoir computer computing is a deep learning framework for processing time-dependent data based on the idea of recurrent neural networks, but with a special training methodology. So for what I want to discuss here, you can think of a uh, reservoir con uh, computer as a continuously evolving dynamical system, okay, with multiple nodes, um, that responds to an input stimulus UT, uh, and converts the input to an output stream, yeah? Computing the function capital F of UT, which in turn is a functional of the output layer 
WO. And what is the output layer? Well, it's simply uh, the, a linear sort of uh, combination of the dynamical coordinates uh, of this dynamical system to give you a new signal yt, which is the function f. Okay, so it's a linear output layer. That's what we, I will be referring to as a linear output layer. Um, so reservoir computing is by now uh, pretty well established and uh, the effectiveness of this approach has been demonstrated with various computational tasks, such as forecasting and classification um, you know, for a number of array of interesting um, information processing applications. And you know, this thing has, this idea has been in existence for the past 20 years, um, but um, today in, in my talk, I'm gonna be discussing a hardware reservoir computing approach. Uh, to processing quantum signal, quantum signals, okay, not classical signals. Uh, the reservoir computer that we envision is uh, in, in, in what we envision a, uh, a, uh, a device made of Josephson nonlinear oscillators that reside in a cryogenic environment. The uh, input signal to be processed is encoded in microwave signals that um, you know that encode a certain information like image classification you want to do um, and that um, is now um, uh, you know impinges on your uh, Josephson nonlinear oscillators exciting the systems into an interesting dynamics uh, and scattering from those uh, nodes off into uh, another transmission line that routes it outside the fridge um, and, uh, you know, we want to train the output the, uh, of, of, um, of this system. And one can consider various computational tasks. This is, uh, as, as I uh, indicated, you know, it's subject for another talk. It's very interesting, very general information processing framework. Um, and in this talk, the computational task we will consider will be the classification of um, the quantum signals coming from a system you're trying to quantum system you're trying to measure. Um, and I will not be talking about some parallel work we are carrying out where we implemented image classification, um, um, you know, classical machine learning task. Okay. So um, this is, here's the proposal. Um, in, in, in a typical setup, we envision the quantum system we want to measure is either housed in a separate fridge or the same fridge as shown uh, upstream from the uh, reservoir, superconducting in this case, reservoir. Um, and the quantum system is, um, is excited uh, with the microwave pulse that is, as we have discussed, for readout is scatters of these systems. Um, and that is injected. So this is sort of what, what you see here, you know, the scatter signal is noisy um, and it's sort of in, injected into the reservoir that generates a complex dynamics as, as shown here, um, which essentially integrates out, integrates the signal, right? Over its evolution in a complicated way because it's a nonlinear device. Um, and then uh, we want that the, um, for this particular task, uh, we want to optimize the output layer, you know, determine the WO, that is, um, that, uh, that the quantum state of the system is classified with as high fidelity as possible. So once this is done, and if you have set things up correctly, the uh, reservoir computer returns the real time probability of the measured system being in a given state. So turns out, you know, a single qubit readout is too simple um, for, for this kind of, uh, to evaluate the efficacy of reservoir computer approach. So we have turned to what's called joint dispersive readout of multiple qubits. Um, and the, this, this idea of joint dispersive readout that we'll focus on here allows uh, to measure the system of multiple qubits. I'm showing here two. 
simultaneously through a shared resonator mode. So let's now assume that the system is described by a multi-qubit uh, uh, dispersive Hamiltonian, <clears throat> just for the sake of the slide. Um, and it's not important that you understand um, you know, what this is for uh, the physics we are going to be discussing. Um, and let me first go over the uh, standard implementation of joint dispersive readout using uh, op optimal filters, match filters, um, as has been done in the Valorov group at ETH uh, in, in 2009. Um, just like before, the system is initialized in known states with high certainty, okay? Um, and uh, for, for each state, thousands of pulses and thousands of runs are done. In this case, we have four states, right? Uh, for two qubits in the measurement basis. And for each state, you, you have thousand uh, sort of samples, measurement records. And then you train your match filter um, and that's not unique as we understand. So we don't actually know how uh, Andreas Walroff's group has uh, implemented this. This is all synthetic that we uh, generate through our modeling um, of, of the system. Um, and then, you know, for let's say up, up, uh, you, you, um, you get this match, uh, the filter trajectory like this. And for each time you see, uh, you have four bins now, and if it falls, if this trajectory falls into, into a particular bin, you label it with as such. Yeah. So this is already now the job is done by the match filter uh, optimization. Okay. Okay. So an important metric for readout calibration is classification fidelity reached on a test sample at a given time as a function of the sample size Q, yeah? So, you know, as I said, you use certain number of measurement records for each state, known state, right? To construct this match filter. And if you use just one state, one measurement run for each state, so four measurement records, then the uh, classification fidelity uh, as a function of time of recording uh, executes uh, a trajectory like this, yeah. And so what that means, for instance, at the peak fidelity, which is reached around six cavity lifetimes, you see 0 0.4, that means that only 40% of the tra trajectories are classified correctly, okay? That's because you, you don't sample enough. So if you use five samples, you get this, 20 samples, 100 samples, and in the theoretical infinite number of sample limit, you still not uh, get a finite peak fidelity, you know, at, at a particular time here. Um, and from there, it actually starts going down. And why does it go down? Well, basically, um, the, we, in this modeling, we model um, and you have a lot of qubits um, that uh, experience uh, a back action and have a quantum jump. Um, and you lose the information. You're, so you cannot recover that information that is lost, right? So it goes down the longer you do this. Um, okay, now, so this is sort of as a function of Q, right? And what I wanna do is now, uh, you know, do this for many Qs, also intervening Qs, and look at the P classification fidelity reached, you know, that happens the peak classification fidelity is reached at different times for each sample size, right? And plot that, that value, that peak classification fidelity as a training size, as a function of Q, yeah? And you see how uh, this uh, slowly, as a function of the training size, the fidelity is reaching, you know, saturating. And, and you really need, you know, uh, upwards of 100 trajectories here. And in realistic um, experiments, you would need, uh, you know, thousands of, of samples per state. Now we want to analyze in the rest of the talk how one can do this now with, an, with analog hardware uh, based on the idea of reservoir computing that I described. And the chief goal is going to be to reduce latency 
without compromising classification fidelity. So before discussing the training procedure and performance, um, a few words about the physical uh, structure of the reservoir. Uh, we envision we have a reservoir that is based on Josephson junction nonlinear oscillators, where exchange interactions are um, mediated by a common electromagnetic um, uh, environment. Yeah, and this kind of um, and that is described by this Hamiltonian here. You got the individual uh, nonlinear oscillators. Uh, their nonlinearity is shown here in lambda, capital lambda, that will be important. They're hopping um, um, between the nonlinear nodes. And finally, this is what I call the input layer at Hamiltonian level. Um, this is where the, you know, the information comes in and drives these individual nodes. And uh, you, to construct the data that I've shown you, we, we essentially need to solve the quantum master equation um, and not, I think what I'm not showing here is that um, uh, the important piece is that we're actually uh, solving the stochastic quantum mass equation so that we can sample individual uh, trajectories um, that one would be getting um, in, at room temperature, right? Oh, so one detail is that the results that we are going to be discussing in the rest of the talk um, is uh, going to be um, at in the semi-classical limit um, where the signal to noise ratio is very high. Um, so we are essentially, we'll be driving the measured system with very high intensity with large pulses. And so that sort of makes the computational work um, feasible because we'll be also basically looking at a uh, you know, large uh, system here. Okay. So, yeah, and yeah, one important, another important aspect probably I should mention for uh, is, is that, you know, the essential, the, the, the parameters here for the nice thing about this reservoir computing approach is that the parameters here don't need to be fine tuned. They can be all uh, within a certain range of parameters. Um, and that's, that's a very important, uh, turns out to be very important. Um, so finally, some results. Um, and I'm showing here a visualization of how training looks like uh, for a five node reservoir. Uh, we have chosen the parameters to be within the range of uh, fabrication capabilities. Um, here is uh, one trajectory, noise trajectory, for one of the quadratures of the microwave signal that is, in, that is sort of coming from a system containing a qubit that is in the up, that is prepared in the up up state, that you know, deterministically prepared up up state, right? Um, and we inject it into the reservoir. Here is the evolution of the individual nodes of the reservoir, you know, undergoing rather complex nonlinear dynamics. Um, and I'm showing here. Now, this is now the, the, you know, the output layer is, has been optimized through training. Um, and I'm showing now here a test uh, situation where uh, I'm plotting the evolving probability distribution that uh, the system predicts for this particular noisy input. And you, should, you see over a certain time, uh, the probability of the reservoir predicts the probability of finding the state in up up uh, state uh, saturates over time. Now, I want to show you also the ground truth for this, right? Uh, which is we have access to because we are simulating this. Um, and the, uh, I'm showing here in the dashed line for this particular up up state how the um, the uh, the it's um, you know probability is varying over time, and you see here um, this uh, state this 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 qubit experiences some you know quantum jump like fluctuations, and despite that, 
the uh, classification fidelity probability remains high. Um, so this, you know, this tells you um, really that these reservoirs are uh, very um, effective in uh, in classifying these states. Well, details aside, there's a lot of detail that I'm not going to be able to uh, discuss here. But the most uh, striking result of, uh, of this work and the takeaway message is that the reservoir computer is a fast learner. Yeah. Um, after already seeing just a few samples, the reservoir, is few samples per state, the reservoir is able to classify with rather high fidelity. I'm plotting here the same plot that I had for the match filter. Um, Pre-classification fidelity is a function of the training sample size. And as you see, it, it's already size very large and remains high. And so, um, and I, I remind you, this is not a huge reservoir as typically is uh, used in, uh, uh, in uh, reservoir com classical reservoir computing literature where you, um, you know, typically you simulate a thousand node reservoir. This is a five node reservoir and it's able to really class do this um, quite efficiently. Um, okay, I, uh, so, and uh, it's, you know, when we, when we basically um, ended up um, find, sort of getting when the dust settled and we, um, we saw that this is where um, uh, a reservoir computer is very effective. It can learn very fast. Turn, you know, and that is very important, important for online quantum computing systems where the systems have to be periodically taken offline to, re, to be recalibrated, the readout system calibration and all that, simply because there are uh, essentially um, random qubit drifts and, and so on. Um, this of, offers a uh, really important uh, prospect for doing that calibration uh, very fast. Okay, so of course, as physicists, we were intrigued, intrigued why the, uh, such a small reservoir is able to uh, do this classification task. And I've, in the last slide, two slides, I wanna show that you can actually get behind this. Um, so um, I'm showing here a cut through the measurement space of what we are recording, what is coming from the reservoir. Yeah. So normally you record, you would record two quadratures per node. Okay. So if there are n reservoir nodes, there would be two n dimensional phase space in which the dynamics is taking place in response to an incoming microwave signal. Um, and we were able to bring it down to just um, two nodes um, and still be able to do where we can actually visualize what is happening. So this is two nodes and we are taking a measurement surface of section through this four dimensional phase space of two nodes. And here are uh, the uh, results for you know, thousands of measurements with up spin, up up. Uh, and this is thousands of you know, recorded signals in the steady state when the system reaches, reservoir reaches steady state for zero, zero, and so on. And this is when you classify uh, you know, when you construct the optimal um, sort of output layer, what you're saying is that you can draw these lines that pass through the origin um, that can, can or cannot separate these distributions. In, in, in this case, we managed to do that. Yeah? And each of them lies in a different place, each of the distributions. And therefore, anything that lands here, we classify um, as qubit, um, you know, what is this? Um, so unfortunately, um, I'm, my color blindedness is causing difficulty here, but I think this is zero, zero. Yeah, down, down spin. Um, but why is it 
that um, that my reservoir, by just looking at a single trajectory, actually do this classification. You know, that's the thing. That was the key uh, finding. And you, I'm showing here individual samples, individual trajectories through for the evolution of the reservoir. Now, these are, you know, many, many sort of averages in the state of state. But now I'm showing individual trajectories. And you see that individual trajectories pass right through this distribution, right? And right here. So that is why, because individual reservoir trajectories are information rich and they sample the phase space as many, ever, uh, many, ensemble, and many measurements would do for you, okay? And that is not all. Um, you can show further that nonlinearity is essential. You, know, you could say, well, what if I use a linear reservoir? Yeah. And that's shown here. Uh, for a linear reservoir, nonlinearity is zero. You will find that these distributions sort of fall almost on a line. Okay. And so according to this classification, linear classification scheme, they only they cannot be separated. You know, if you look at it closely, you will find that only 50% of the uh, of the trajectories are classified correctly. The high accuracy of the nonlinear system is really due to its nonlinearity, um, as which works by essentially tilting these distributions in the phase space in, uh, so that they can be uh, linearly separated. Um, right, so this really brings me to the end of my talk. Um, um, thank you for listening patient patiently. I want to give you some take home messages. Um, um, in this last slide, uh, I told you that reservoir computing approach told you about a particular uh, approach inspired by reservoir computing to quantum signal processing. Um, and if I've discussed a hardware a proposal for a hardware efficient cryogenic analog processor for readout. Um, and I've shown you that really most importantly, the lesson we learned is that such a reservoir has a fast learning capacity. Um, and what I've not discussed is that, you know, readout is the simplest thing you can do. It's a basic building block of many more complicated things like quantum state tomography. And finally, the scheme is really gen general, uh, fairly general. You, um, you know, it can be done in optical um, range regime and uh, you can apply it to various quantum systems and different measurement schemes. Thank you. I'm applauding for on behalf of everybody. Thank you very much, Akan. This is a very inspiring, very modern, very, very fresh and nice uh, talk. <clears throat> so I will look to the audience for some questions. I will also have some of my questions as well. OK, so let's start with the question from Professor Zafar Gedik of Sabancı University. He asks, should the reservoir computer obey the second law of thermodynamics? Can decreasing entropy be an advantage? So, you know, um, I do remember my thermodynamics class from Zafer. So, you know, I and looking back, I think I um, I had a hard time understanding entropy. And now I understand why. And that is because, you know, everything uh, we, um, we do here is really in full non-equilibrium. And the classification here is done uh, in the transient, right? I mean, we don't even read state state. We can, where you can think of a, um, an effective equilibrium. Um, but I, I think I understand what, what, what Zafer is getting to. And that is, you know, what happens, perhaps, if I understand correctly, what, um, when you get to a situation where the excitations are, uh, is, is much, a much lower level. And that happens when, you know, you drive the readout cavity um, with a very weak signal. You know, you send one photon, let's say, 
through the um, through the readout cavity. And then the reservoir computer operates totally in the quantum regime. You have to, uh, and what happens at that point is really the subject of the most exciting part of the study. That's where we wanted to get to what happens in the quantum limit. Uh, I mean, the, the results I'm discussing are, you know, taking into account uh, quantum uh, physics um, to a certain extent, but the full quantum limit where the, everything is sort of talking to each other and you get lots of fluctuations uh, and you know, noise far larger than the signal, I don't know how it would help. You know, I don't know how entanglement would help because we clearly see that entanglement is not, you know, is, uh, is not the starting point here, right? If we do find it here that entanglement is important in the reservoir, then I, you know, I will understand how entanglement is important for quantum information processing. Finally, <laughs> um, I hope that's the question he asked. At least that's what you know. I uh, probably, but what I understood. Thank you. So there is another question, maybe somewhat related to this, by Emre Tashkin. Dr. Emre Tashkin is from Hacettepe University. He wants to know uh, about the implementation when you send the single pulse. Do you know which one it will interact, which qubit it will interact with, and uh, do you expect some kind of coherent superpositions of these qubits? Yeah. Well, um, so that's the input layer which I didn't touch on. So you know, in in this setup, we find essentially we have a time series, right, for a um, for a signal. It's a scalar signal. And this input layer is supposed to distribute that signal with different weights into the individual reservoir computers. So they, all of them see different, you know, weighted uh, sort of versions of the input, the stochastic input signal. Um, and of course, uh, you know, any kind of superposition state or entangled state generated in the reservoir is um, going to be important. As I, but as I discussed in this talk, the results I've shown you and that are currently in the, uh, is public in the public domain uh, in this paper that I've shown initially, um, that's done in the semi-classical regime, um, you know, very high power, lots of excitation in the system. Thank you. So Emre wants to continue asking uh, somewhat related to that. So if the initial state is not like up and down, but also some superposition like one, one plus zero, zero, can you still classify it or? Yeah, that's exactly, we have uh, looked at that question. Um, so once you train it with the basis states, right? You, you train it with only, you allow yourself to only train it with basis states. It is able to discern the probability distribution of a superposition state of let's say zero zero and one one but the probability distribution so it wouldn't uh you know in a sense if you go with the current scheme and come up with something creative don't come up with something creative it wouldn't be able to distinguish whether that's in a mixed state or whether it's in a coherent superposition states i see <clears throat> So let me take this break and ask my question. So mm -hmm. the learning process is about uh, finding some weight factors typically to these connectivities, but uh, there is also this so-called uh, morphologic or neuromorphologic computation approaches where these reservoir connectivities are also important. And there are some models which connectivity will give the best. Uh, so is there also some kind of optimization here regarding the connectivities or? Yes. So let me just, you know, touch on one thing. Um, I, that's, you know, this is essentially what very broadly what folks call in the community. Uh, one talks about neuromorphic computing. This is one instance of that. Uh, the, but it's distinguished by the fact that you do not train the internal connections. Yeah. So it's given by the design um, and you only allow yourself to train this output, linear output uh, classifier, linear classified at the output. 
Um, so that's one. Uh, two, um, uh, there's been some uh, so findings in the reservoir computing community that uh, the the class and that's for classical dynamical systems that the classical syst uh, dynamical system has to be at the edge of chaos mm. and uh, and that you know and then there is some related understanding of what kind of interconnection matrix W R uh, puts you there and um you know then you can relate it to some singular values of, of that connectivity matrix but in and we study we study studied this as part of this work uh, and what we find is slightly different um and probably that's maybe you know subject of uh, another research talk on this topic it's very interesting very interesting um, there's yeah. some kind of connection to all these dissipative phase transitions and other uh, some second dissipative phase transitions and other things uh, the chaos and fluctuations it's uh, very interesting when you bring this many body reservoir into right the exactly i mean this is sort of you know for theorists that is who's close to applications like me these systems really represent tremendously interesting systems because they are what we would refer to as complex dynamical systems. In this regard, I can let me also ask you, maybe you can speculate. If you also do not only readout, but state preparation with using reservoirs and in middle also computation, so it's some big universal holy reservoir, full reservoir computation picture. Is it something that you want to go in in future or do you yeah. think this is a promising uh, direction? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, I'm pretty, I'm, we are very engaged and interested in, in exactly in, towards that goal, where not not, only you know this is for a specific application. You, you, I think touched on the right point. This is for just readout classification of quantum signals, but it's the real power of reservoir computer uh, resides in feed. You know, additionally feedback, and when you get there and think about feedback. You know, this whole thing becomes just a computer on its own. So what where we want to get to is really think about generally computation, computing with dynamical systems like this. Yeah. Perfect. So I don't want to be taking time from other uh, audience. So there is another question that I want to read. It's a little bit long, so let me read from five. Yeah, sure. Page. Why are we training only a single readout node from which we do time dependent trajectory classification? Is it due to historical reasons? Isn't the training tool to do n separate uh, classification readout nodes more convenient, both in terms of robustness to noise and in terms of scalability to larger number of qubits? I ask this because the trajectories will be very narrowly separated in the output time series as we increase the n beyond two. Well, maybe Fatih, you can answer. Maybe I don't know if our Moderators can do it. Uh, maybe you can turn on and mute, unmute yourself. Honestly, you can discuss because it's a long towards question. Towards the end, towards the end of the sentence, I forgot the beginning of it. Yeah. Um, and we kindly. Yeah. Why don't you? Fat, why doesn't Fatih come online and ask yes, directly? It um, would be uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it was really fun and fruitful for me. And I'm pretty sure for many others as well. Um, yeah, I couldn't ask because I was muted and I couldn't unmute. So the question is the following. I, I, I might be misunderstanding as well, but I see that you are training a single readout neuron from the reservoir that basically does some sort of like a regression. And then from the regressed output trajectory, you are doing a second classification based on where the trajectory is in terms of time. Wouldn't it be easier to train like multi neurons? both all of them are still linear, but instead of doing a regression, so like instead of doing a trajectory regression, you would do like a classification. And then those would tell you basically whether like, if you have like two different qubits then you would have four output neurons and then each of them would pop up whenever like the initial condition is one of them, right? That would be easier to train and it would be scalable because when once you have many qubits, then the neural trajectories of the single that would be very narrow and non-robust noise. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, very good point. 
um, we impact, in fact, I mean, in, in other work, related work, that's what we do with one difference, if I, you know, didn't misunderstand you. Um, so we not, you know, the right thing to do, if it's, especially if you have multiple classes, is to have an output layer, which is multidimensional. Um, and so then WO becomes a matrix. Um, and we, we train, you know, all, essentially all the neurons then at the output. Um, so if I, this is again, if I understand you correctly, because, you know, what I, uh, you know, for me, these reservoir nodes themselves are neurons as well. But the distinction here is that we do not apply, do, we do not do any thresholding on the output nodes. So, we, and I understand what you're saying, and one would have to look at the, uh, at the efficacy of this approach compared to a linear classifier here. Uh, but you can still use the same number of neurons at the output, do it linearly and nonlinearly with nonlinear thresholding and see how, you know, how good a result you can get and compare. I, is, does that make sense? Or were you, were you trying to get to something else? Fatih? I, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Yeah. Now. It does. I might have misunderstood something during the talk, so I will probably reach out later on. Please do. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> and the... Uh, I can't see any more questions except one nice question from Devrim Tarhan. It's also some general question that maybe it's a good question to complete the session. So Devrim wants to know, suppose we learned these methods of machine learning, reservoir computing, is it applicable beyond the superconducting systems? Is it applicable to some other differential equations? How general is it? Oh, you know, when, when, when we started learning about this, you know, it's new to us as well. Um, you know, I would say we started thinking about this about a year, uh, about two years ago. Um, and in the meantime, you know, to me, this is as general as computing with physical systems get. Really, reservoir computing gives you a very general physics of um, a computational machine. Essentially, everything we do in signal processing, everything we do in image processing um, is fits into this framework. The only thing is we don't worry about this being digital. Um, you know, it's an analog thing. And we don't worry about this, uh, these, this machine being constructed to precise specifications. We put all the burden on the training of the output layer. So in that sense, it's very general, it's very practical. Um, and in terms of what physical systems, I can tell you that this has you know, become so ridiculous that um, you, people have done computation with a bucket of water as well, which I tend to show in other talks uh, you know, for fun. Uh, so you know, take a bucket, bucket of water, make the bucket shallow, yeah, water shallow, that is that water is governed by shallow water um, nonlinear wave evolution equations, sufficiently complex and nonlinear. And you train a you know a optical sort of uh, mask to read out, train it to read out the right result for you know spoken digit recognition that is acoustically uh, you know modulated into the into the bucket of water. It works. It, you know, but you know, beside one, uh, I think a big, big question in the field today is why does it work? How can we generalize it? And uh, you know, if you push it to the quantum regime, what do we have to pay attention to? And yeah, thank you, thank you, Arkan. So the young people, you get your message. Go ahead, read Hakan's papers and more, and uh, think about it. Imagination is always the limit. So I applaud Hakan uh, again for this uh, very nice talk and being with us. Thank you. It's, uh, and uh, for this nice evening shared with Hakan. Thank you very much for our participants, questions and 
everybody talk today and thank organizers again. Okay, good evening to everyone. Good evening.